So welcome to the afternoon session of our conference. My name is Christoph Kams. I work in the Monetary Policy Department at ECB, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to chair this session. The papers in this session are both of high academic relevance and very topical. Both papers put the inner workings of the labor market at the center of analysis. That's relevant for us as central bankers because the resilience of labor markets on both sides of the Atlantic during the last tightening cycle has been truly remarkable. And so from a central bank's perspective, there's a premium on a deeper understanding on the workings of the labor market and the channels at work. So both papers contribute to this deeper understanding. The first paper sheds new light on the question on when the labor market is or is not a source of inflationary pressure. The second paper revisits the welfare cost of inflation and how those costs are related to particular features of the labor market. So I'm very much looking forward to the presentations and the discussions by our distinguished speakers. And so for the first paper, our presenter will be Fabien postel Vinet, who is head of the economics department at UCL. And he will present his paper entitled The Job Ladder, Inflation versus Redistribution. The discussant is uh, Kerstin Holsoy, who is an assistant professor at Sciences Po. As to the ground rules are the same as before, so Fabien will give you 25 minutes for the presentation and then 15 minutes for the discussion and after that I'll give you an opportunity to reply and then we will open the floor for questions. So with that, Fabien, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph, and thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, having having me on, on the program. Uh, this is uh, a joint part of a joint project, a long-standing project with uh, my uh, long -stand, long time co-author Giuseppe Mascarini, which is about the uh, uh, the uh, specification and estimation of the Phillips curve. Uh, today we're going to you know talk more about specification than, than estimation. So as we all know, the, the Phillips curve uh, you know, was, was born some three quarters of a century ago as, a, as the observation of an inverse short run relationship uh, between some measure of aggregate slack uh, in the economy and inflation. Uh, and it still looms large in, in uh, you know, the, uh, the design of monetary policy t to this date. Now, uh, in the uh, uh, you know, sort of original kind of renditions of the Phillips curve, the uh, traditional measure of aggregate slack uh, is, is focused on the unemployment rate. Uh, in terms of the theoretical organizing framework uh, or modern theoretical organizing framework that people used to think about, the Phillips, the Phillips curve in, uh, in, in more formal models that are used for uh, prediction or for understanding you know, the dynamics of inflation, uh, you know the the, the new Keynesian uh, Phillips curve is is the specification that is uh, you know that, that we all know and love, uh, and uh, you know it specifies inflation pi t here in, in this notation as a function of the marginal production cost, um, which is denoted here as m c hat, and uh, uh, expectations of future uh, inflation. Now the question that we're going to to uh, focus on here in, in this paper, in this presentation, is uh, we're going to revisit the determinants of the marginal cost. So what is the marginal cost? What's in the marginal cost? Uh, in the standard New Keynesian model, uh, uh, the labor markets are competitive, uh, final goods are produced using basically only labor, and the marginal cost is, is essentially the productivity adjusted real wage, which is a function of the unemployment rate or some sort of aggregate measure of slack like that. And the intuition there is that uh, when unemployment is high, uh, labor is abundant and uh, you know, there's, there's little uh, upward pressure on, 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 the, on the wage. Now in this project, uh, we're going to to, to think about an alternative organizing framework uh, uh, specifically for the, for the labor market. Uh, and that framework is the job ladder. So what is a, a job ladder? It's a view of the, the labor market where jobs are heterogeneous. You have jobs that are more productive and jobs that are less productive or jobs that are more valuable in some dimension than, than others. And importantly, workers all agree on the rankings of jobs. So all workers recognize that job A is more or less productive than job B. It's also a frictional labor market whereby 
workers, whether employed or unemployed, receive job offers, uh, but they received they sample job offers sequentially, not you know at, at a finite rate. And employed workers, in particular, receive outside job offers at a finite and and procyclical rate. Finite because of the frictions, and uh, procyclical because labor demand is procyclical, and labor demand is going to be what drives uh, th those uh, offer arrival rates. Now, in this world, uh, outside job offers can generate one of two things. Either a, a, when an employed worker receives an outside job offer, either they accept the job offer, you know, and that is that is triggers a voluntary move. What that means is that uh, you know, the, the worker moves from one job to another, and, and because all workers agree on the rankings of, of jobs, well, it, it means that the, the job that is being accepted is better than the job that is being left, is more productive than the job that is being left. So from an aggregate standpoint, from the standpoint of aggregate productivity, that's a good thing. It's good reallocation. Or another possibility is that uh, the worker declines the outside offer but just uses it to, uh, to, to bid up the, uh, their, their, their wage in their existing job. And in that case, the outs what the outside offer does is not trigger a reallocation, but only uh, you know, put, puts upward pressure on the, on the labor cost in the existing job and uh, you know, uh, uh, allows the worker to engage in rent, rent extraction and puts inflationary pressure uh, you know, on, on, on labor costs. So uh, that, that's the basic trade-off that we're going to look at today, inflation versus reallocation, uh, the, in, the inflationary versus reallocative impact of, of, of outside job offers. Which one of these effects dominates depends on, uh, well, initial conditions basically, depends on how well matched and how prone to accept or decline outside offers workers are. Uh, how well or badly matched workers are is, is something that we're going to capture with this term of mismatch. We're going to say that workers are mismatched when they're predominantly uh, um, uh, assigned to jobs that are not very productive, uh, and so that they, they're, you know, if, if given the opportunity, they would be very prone to actually leave and, 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 and go into to better matches. And what we argue here, the whole argument of this project is to say that mismatch is a relevant measure of slack on the labor market rather than unemployment. Unemployment is a, is a measure of the quantity of labor that is available. Mismatch, on the other hand, is a, is a, is, is a measure of the quality of, of matches, the quality of labor. And we're going to argue here that, that this, this particular measure is something that should be kept track of when, when trying to think about uh, you know, inflationary pressure on the, on, on, you know, inflationary pressure and, and, uh, and the determinants of inflation. Uh, so how do we measure mismatch? Mismatch is a concept that's kind of you know, easy to think about in a theoretical model, but in, in practice, how do we measure mismatch? So in practice, we're going to propose a, a proxy measure for mismatch, which uh, we're calling the acceptance ratio or the AC ratio. Uh, and what the AC ratio is, is just the ratio between the EE transition rate, EE standing for employer to employer transition rate, so the, the rate at which work, employed workers move jobs without an intervening period of unemployment, divided by the UE transition rate, which is the rate at which unemployed workers find jobs. So those two rates are easily measurable in the data, uh, one more easily than, than the other, but they're still, they're, they're still measurable in the data. So why do we think that this is a, a, you know, a, a, an empirical proxy for mismatch? Well, because we can decompose these, these two rates. So if you look at what's on the numerator here, uh, the, the EE transition rate, the rate at which uh, uh, um, workers move from job to job, equals, well, the uh, the amount of effort, you could say, that, that employed workers put into search, multiplied by the, the, the overall contact rate, the rate at which they get in touch, if you like, with, or they, get, they become aware of, of, of available jobs, multiplied by the probability that if given an offer, they accept it. That's what's in the numerator. In the denominator, you have the same thing for unemployed workers. Now, the trick here is that if at least if search is random, the rate at which employed and unemployed workers get contacted by jobs are the same. And so they, they, they cancel out in this ratio here. Now, we're left with these two ratios that are, that are in black here in this, in this formula. And well, both of these two ratios are high when employed workers are poorly matched. Why? Well, because when employed workers are poorly matched, they're keen to change jobs, and so they put a lot of effort into search. 
hence the, the, the ratio on the left here is, is high. And also when employed workers are poorly matched, well, they're most, more likely to accept any, any, any random offer that, that, they, that they receive because it's more likely that that offer will improve on their current situation. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the sort of uh, paper in a nutshell. Now, uh, let me go into sort of a bit more of the specifics. Um, there's gonna be two sh short parts to this presentation. One is going to be looking at very kind of high level uh, descriptive evidence about measures of uh, inflation co-moving with, with this acceptance rate or this AC ratio. And then I'm going to very briefly sketch a new Keynesian DSGE model uh, with on the job search uh, that, that does uh, make sense in a theoretical framework of this uh, uh, balance between um, uh, labor reallocation and rent extraction. And one of the contributions here uh, will be a tractable treatment of search frictions with on the job search uh, in, in, a, in the new Keynesian framework. So, uh, empirics. Uh, just some orders of magnitude to start with. The, the monthly employer to employer transition probably, this is all about the US, but the, those orders of, of magnitude are you know, reasonably similar in Europe as well. So the monthly employer to employer transition probability is about 2% of, of, of employment. The monthly unemployment to employment transition probability is much higher, it's about 30% of unemployment. However, the stocks of origin for, to which these two rates apply uh, are, are very different, and the stock of employment is about 10 to 20 times uh, larger than the, than the stock of, of, of unemployment. So if you look at the numbers of hires that come from unemployed workers versus employed workers, they're you know, roughly of the same order of magnitude. So it's, it's a conservative conclusion to say that uh, the flows, direct flows from employment to employment uh, uh, are of similar magnitude in accounting for employment reallocation as direct flows for, as flows from unemployment to, to employment. Now, if you look at the EE rate and the UE rate in the data, you can see them both in this, in this graph. The blue one is the EE rate. Uh, you see that they're both very procyclical, but that they behave slightly differently. You can see that you know, the blue uh, series, which is the EE rate, tapers off a little bit uh, sooner in, uh, you know, in, 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 um, in expansions than the UE rate. And indeed, if you take the ratio, so if you construct that AC ratio, acceptance rate that, that, that I talked about, and, and, and plot it, uh, you get the, the blue line here. Um, and you see that it's got a, a, a very, very strongly countercyclical behavior. And on this graph, I've also plotted year-on-year -year wage inflation, which is pro-cyclical, and, and you know, it's, it's apparent on this graph, and this is just eyeballing graphs. You know, this is not very sophisticated econometrics, but it's very um, uh, apparent on this graph that uh, year-on-year -year wage inflation is strongly negatively correlated with, uh, with the AC ratio. So we're going to, to now, uh, uh, okay, so we, we're, we're going to argue, and we do that we, you know, in, in other parts of the project, we do slightly more sophisticated econometrics than that to sort of buttress that argument, but uh, we're going to argue that there's a robust negative relationship between the AC rate and, the, and subsequent inflation, and conclude that our empirical acceptance rate is an inverse uh, predictor of inflation. Now the next thing we do is, is put that into a theoretical model to make sense both qualitatively and quantitatively of, of this empirical uh, remark. So I'm gonna very, very briefly sketch the model. Uh, the model is basically a new Keynesian model in which we just replace the, the standard neoclassical labor supply with a, with a frictional labor market with on-the-job search. So uh, you know, there are building blocks to this model. The first building block is a standard three equation uh, new Keynesian model. Uh, describing just the, the, the final goods market and the monetary policy rule. Now, the difference to the standard new Keynesian model here that, that we introduce is that the, the, the input factor for the, into the production of, of the final good is what we call a labor services, which is so, sold by, sold by you know, firms that I'm going to describe in a minute to, to final goods producers at a price of omega T. And uh, the way that labor services are produced is by hiring worker on a frictional labor market. Uh, um, you know, firms do so, uh, f firms that we call service producers do so, uh, and, uh, and, and so they hire labor on a, in a decentralized uh, search market. And these hired workers get sorted into matches that are heterogeneous in, in productivity. Um, uh, and, you know, meaning the amount of service that they produce, and then that, produ that service is, is, is sold to final goods producers as essentially packaged labor. 
So this job surge block, or this kind of service sector, replaces the neoclassical labor supply. Um, uh, you know, this, this service output is essentially packaged labor, as I said, and the service price, omega t, is going to be our measure of the average nominal wage. Now, uh, workers and firms in, this, in the, that kind of service sector face search frictions. And there's a job ladder in that upon meeting in pairs, workers and firms draw a constant match productivity that we're going to denote Y here, which is uh, distributed according to some distribution gamma. Uh, and so higher values of Y are mean higher pro productivity jobs. And so workers are trying to sort themselves gradually as they can into higher productivity jobs. Right? Uh, now, the way that rent sharing is going to occur here is that recruiters are going to compete in contracts for both uh, types of workers, so unemployed and employed workers, um, using a sequential auction mechanism. And you know, without going into the details of that, the, um, the, the sequential auction mechanism has this intuitive uh, uh, sort of feature that uh, it is more costly for an employer to poach a worker out of a high productivity job than it is to to poach a worker out of a low productivity job, meaning that, and this is where we're going to get sort of most of, of our sort of intuition, is that if a lot of employed workers are in low productivity jobs, then it's going to be relatively easy to poach them, and it's going to be relatively profitable to, 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 uh, to post vacancies and to try and, and, and uh, hire employed workers already. If on the contrary, so the uh, workers are, are very well matched and are in very high quality uh, jobs, then it's going to be a lot harder for uh, uh, vacancies to poach employed workers. Now, I, I'm not gonna talk about the, the new Keynesian block of this, of this, of this, this model because it's, it's completely standard new Keynesian and you know, we, we're all very familiar with, with that model. I'm just going to talk about the, the, the condition that, uh, uh, you know, that, that governs job creation in this economy because this is kind of the one thing that is, uh, is slightly more, more unusual in, in these models. Uh, and rather than hitting you with a bunch of mathematical notation, I'm, I'm just going to use words to describe that equation. So job creation as all of the, in all of these uh, uh, search models is governed by what's called the free entry condition, which is basically the profit maximization condition of, of, uh, of uh, employers in the service sector. And in the standard kind of unemployed job surge textbook matching model, what you have is that the free entry condition writes is what's on the slide right now, which, which says that the marginal hiring cost, uh, which is an increasing function of labor market tightness, is, is, is equated to the expected surplus from, from, unemployed, for, from an unemployed hire. If only unemployed workers look for jobs, you can only hire unemployed workers, and you know, uh, what you're, you're going to post vacancies until the marginal cost of posting the next vacancy is, is equal to the expected surplus from, from meeting an unemployed worker. That's the sort of textbook matching model. In a world with on-the-job search, though, you don't only meet unemployed workers, you also meet employed workers. And so that condition becomes a little bit more complicated. You still have the, the first term, which now is multiplied by the probability of meeting an unemployed worker when you're a vacancy. And then you have a second term, which is what ha the, you know, uh, sort of reflects what happens when, 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 you, uh, uh, when, you, when you meet an employed job applicant. Uh, in this case, um, uh, you know, the expected surplus from, from uh, recruiting or from meeting an employed job applicant is different because, you know, when you meet an unemployed job applicant, you have to compensate them, compensate them for the value of unemployment, which is typically low. If you, have, if you meet an employed job applicant, then you have to compensate them if you want to hire them for the value of their current job, which is presumably higher and even higher if that applicant is, is already very well matched. In fact, we show in the paper that uh, this, uh, this term in red here, the expected surplus from employed hires, which we call the mismatch wedge, is a function of only a, is not a function of, of uh, you know, uh, worker preferences or the unemployment rate. It's only a function of the distribution of match quality amongst exist, existing uh, 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 matches. And it has intuitive properties. In particular, an improvement in the employment allocation, so higher qualities of, quality, if you like, of existing matches, leads to well, a fall in this red term, so what we call the mismatch wage, hence on the prof profitability of employed hires. And because the profitability of employed hires falls, well, that causes a fall in the incentive for firms to, to pose vacancies, a fall in hires, a fall or slow down in job ladder upgrading, and ultimately a fall in the supply of this labor service. And because uh, there's a fall in the supply of this labor service, that causes 
uh, upward pressure on the nominal marginal cost, omega t, which is the, the price of labor services. Uh, for final goods producers, and ultimately that increase in omega t will be reflected in price price inflation. Okay, now one very important thing about this this red term here, this uh, uh, expected surplus from employed hire, is that is that as I said, it, it it's essentially a function of of the distribution of match quality amongst existing matches. Now this is a very very slow moving object. This is, a, this is a whole distribution, and the, this is a, a, a distribution that evolves at the pace that workers can reallocate across jobs. And if you remember, I gave you an order of magnitude. The, the E to E transition rate, on average, is something like 2% a month. So it, it's, very, it, it's not very high at all. And that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, any measure, let's say the mean match quality, as I'll illustrate in a second with, with, with um, um, quantitative results, is extremely persistent. It evolves very, very slowly. And that's important because the other terms up, you know, the other term here, the expected surplus from unemployed hires, that, that, that you know, has essentially no dynamics. That evolves extremely, extremely quick, quickly. And so introducing on-the-job search in this job ladder in this, uh, in, this, uh, you know, in this framework is going to, amongst other things, and independent of any consideration about inflation, is going to, is going to uh, introduce a, a very potent endogenous propagation mechanism in, into, into the model. So uh, let me show you in my final five minutes. I'm not even sure I'm going to need all of that. Uh, let me show you some, some results. Um, so, so here this is, I'm going to show you a bunch of impulse response functions and try to give you some, some, some comments. Uh, they're from a, a linearized version of, of the model, uh, which I haven't really described in detail, but it's a model that features the monetary policy role here is going to be a standard Taylor role. Uh, we're going to add an intensive margin of labor supply, so workers are going to have, uh, uh, you know, to make choices of, of, about, about hours in the, into the production of, of service. And we're going to look at, uh, you know, different types of shocks hitting the, the economy. Uh, the Taylor rule is estimated outside of the model using, using GMM, and then the rest of the model is calibrated to match some steady state moments. We're really not wedded to the particular calibration here. What I'm trying to illustrate is, is more the, the qualitative mechanism. Uh, so a lot of impulse response functions, uh, which I'm going to, to try and, uh, well, I'm not going to walk you through all of them, but I'm going to try and extract some of you know, the, the main, the main uh, information from, from that. Though those are uh, impulse responses from contra contractionary shocks to TFP monetary policy and, and the, the you know, consumption leisure marginal rate of substitution, for uh, illustration purposes, we're making those shocks quasi-permanent. So we're exaggerating the persistence of those shocks uh, just to make this is just to make the, the you know those those figures more you know starker and, 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 and more readable, not because we think that shocks are that persistent. Obviously, in the paper, we have a version of the model where we have realistic persistence in there and simulate the entire, uh, the entire uh, model. So here, the first column uh, you know, just gives you the, the dynamics of the shock, and then the, the other columns are, are uh, responses of, uh, of various uh, endogenous quantities. So I want to emphasize three things from, from this and, and the next slide. Oh, uh, something I forgot to say is that on, on every, uh, on every uh, sort of panel here, you have a dashed black line and a blue line. Uh, the black line, dashed black line, is our model when we shut down on the job search, and the blue line is our model with on the job search. Okay? And so the first thing I want to emphasize is that if you compare the dashed line and the solid line, uh, you see that, uh, uh, well, on the job search makes two important differences. One is about amplification, and the other one is about propagation. And uh, let me emphasize the propagation uh, aspect here. Uh, the blue line is, you know, has kind of dynamics that are sort of much more persistent or much more sort of long-lasting than, than, than the dashed line in, 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 in all cases here. And that is exactly due to the thing that I was telling you earlier, is that uh, here labor demand responds to what we call the mismatch wedge, so this, this uh, expected profit from, from hiring an employee, from meeting an employed worker, which is something that, as I will illustrate in the next slide, you know, uh, evolves extremely slowly over the business cycle, uh, just because it evolves at the pace that uh, which workers can, can reallocate up and down the, the job ladder. And so that is, you know, what, what you know, generate a lot of, of, of propagation, uh, internal propagation in, 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 in these, uh, in these uh, uh, impulse response functions. 
Speaking of the mismatch wedge, I want to illustrate this on this, you know, this is more impulse response functions, but the one that I would like to focus on here, I don't know if the clicker works, but the laser works, but um, are the ones here which are the Collins uh, labeled AC rate and match quality. So AC rate is, is our acceptance ratio, so the ratio of the EE rate over the UE rate. And match quality is just the average match quality uh, amongst employed workers. And you can see that both of these things Evolves ve evolve very very slowly uh, uh, over uh, you know uh, in response to those to those uh, to those shocks and you see that you know as is intuitive those shocks are all contractionary uh, and so uh, you know what it does to average match quality is that average match quality goes down because labor demand goes down so fewer workers find jobs uh, it's harder to sort of climb the job ladder. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the, the, so, so, well, the uh, workers climb the job ladder more slowly and they get stuck at lower rungs of the job ladder. And because they get stuck at lower rungs of the job ladder, well, they're more prone to, they're increasingly prone to accepting outside job offers, this, which is why the, the acceptance uh, uh, rate here, uh, uh, you know, goes up. Now, one important uh, sort of prediction of our model is, is this, is that uh, this, those are the, the same impulse response functions, only here I'm plotting the inflation rate. Uh, against the AC probability. And you can see that for all of these shocks, apart from you know, initial few periods here, uh, there's a very, very long uh, sort of period uh, of time following each shock in, during which uh, the AC rate and the inflation rate co-move uh, co uh, um, you know, you know, in, in opposite directions, right? Which is uh, sort of the, the counterpart to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, 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 the empirical prediction that, that I showed you in the at the beginning of this talk. Okay, so this is, since I have 10 seconds left, I'm just gonna move on to the, to the conclusion slide. I'm not going to repeat what I've, I've just said here. Uh, I'm just, uh, just gonna sort of state the conclusion here, which is not just quantity, the quantity of employment, but also the quality matters. And that non-employment is just the bottom rung of, of a much higher job ladder, and that the entire distribution of employment over the job ladder matters. And that when one thinking about monetary policy, central banks should should watch this this AC rate. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jasmine, if you want to take over. So first, let me thank you, the organizers. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and to discuss this paper. Um, so let me start out by saying that this is a paper that bridges literatures. So this is basically a paper that brings insights and new insights, I feel, from labor search into a completely different area that is monetary policy. And I would like to say that there are very few papers that can actually claim such a feat and come to completely new insights. And that's basically what I want to do today in my discussion to show you these new insights. So um, let me start out with a summary. So this paper explains inflation dynamics in a standard DSGE new Keynesian model with on-the-job search. So far, there is not so much new things. What is new here is that there is a sequential bargaining protocol. And um, maybe to, to sum up or to give a little bit more insight on this uh, sequential bargaining protocol, um, this is something that basically explains how workers can increase their income through on-the-job search, not only by changing employers, but also on the job by rebargaining their wage. And that's something that many of you maybe have experienced over their lives, that maybe they, maybe they get an outside offer and then they actually change the wage at their job. And uh, this is basically at the core of this paper and it is brought into a DSG New Keynesian model. So what do we get out of this? We get a novel transmission of economic shocks. We get a model implied statistic of economic slack. And, uh, um, Basically, to, just to sum up again this main mechanism, we have on-the-job search uh, that yields to outside offers. Because of these outside offers, there is potential wage uh, increases on the job, which can potentially aggregate it at the level of the economy through the uh, vacancy posting that Fabien uh, um, described, create cost-pushed shock, cost shocks and lead to inflation. 
So the, um, uh, what is basically here new is that in the previous literature, we always thought of the outside option in the bargaining process between workers and firm has been the unemployment option. And this is not longer the case here. Here we are acknowledging that people have a very different history of outside offers, and we are therefore saying these outside offers are the outside option of the workers, and they are therefore relevant for wage setting and the marginal cost. So what I'm going to do today is three things. I'm going to show you that this is already an influential paper, and that it actually changes perspectives in two respects, first on inflation and on economic slack. And uh, therefore, I would like to ask new questions and, ask the, uh, and try to discuss whether uh, we can use the AC um, metric in all circumstances or if there are reasons against it. So first of all, this paper builds on very strong foundations. It's the next step in a series on papers on economic shock transition to labor costs. And Fabien has already said that this is his longstanding co-author. You see here all the series of uh, papers that have built up to basically this paper. Um, it's a very strong point to make this connection between uh, the sequential auction mechanism and inflation or labor costs more generally. And there are many things to like about this paper. Um, he already uh, hinted to that. It's a neat integration um, between a frictional labor market setting and a standard new Keynesian DSG setting. There are model extensions that allow to bring the model closer to other empirical evidence that the literature has already produced uh, uh, since uh, since this paper first came out. Uh, and he actually um, also, there is also some nice uh, twists in the estimation. So they leverage the theory to facilitate the estimation by separating actually the parameter space. So these are things that actually also people who are not uh, trying to estimate this specific model, but other models might be willing to actually take away from this paper. Um, so. It is already an influential paper um, in the sense that many people have actually built on it already. So this paper uh, finds the most easy setup to convey this point, how sequential bargaining leads to changes in marginal costs and leads to changes in inflation dynamics. But other people have asked the question, but what if we change a little bit of the setup? And so, for instance, we might ask, uh, is there actually empirical support for the core movement of the AC um, um, measure and inflation and the authors themselves are actually currently working on the setup. Um, then we could ask, how about reverse causality? Does inflation maybe cause on the job search? And that's actually a paper that we will have after this. Um, what if on the job search intensity varies over the cycle? Uh, a paper has looked at this. How does imperfect insurance change our results? Or how did E2E e mobility impact inflation during the pandemic? So this is basically showing you that this uh, paper has already created some traction in the literature. And um, not only in the literature, it has even made its way into the media. As you can see here, also the Wall Street Journal has actually spoken about it, even though I'm not sure if the authors are so happy about the title of this article. I think that the journal still tried to capture the uh, uh, message. Um, what I would like to focus therefore on, because you can see that my task was not easy. Um, there are all these people who have already thought about very hard what actually can go wrong in this mechanism and what we might want to consider else. I would therefore like to focus instead my attention on what I think how this paper changes our perspective on inflation. And I think it's actually pretty fundamental. And the first two points that I want to make here are about uh, thinking about misallocation um, in the labor market and the relationship with inflation. So here in this model, heightened inflation can be the byproduct of productivity enhancing on the job search. So in a way, Inflation happens, or inflation propagation happens, because these workers are searching for the optimal match. Right? And now we would like to say, well, sometimes you find your optimal match and you're moving to another job. Some other times you don't have the chance, but you can renegotiate. Maybe there is a way for us to help these workers to find their optimal job and not to go through this process, and therefore not create inflation in the same time. But it's not sure that this would actually be optimal because, in fact, in this setup, the workers already get as an option value um, the likelihood of increasing their wage in the next uh, period at their worker. And let me say this differently. If a firm hires a worker, basically the firm pays less for that worker in anticipation of this future renegotiations of these wages. And that means, in fact, there is a value to uh, this delayed um, onset of, uh, of these uh, 
of these wage increases. Second, uh, we can talk about heterogeneity and where, who actually creates these inflationary responses. Not all wage increases are inflationary. So it's actually only those workers who are renegotiating, not who, those who are going to better jobs. Um, second, inflationary pressures derive most strongly from jobs with high match productivity. So it's not the guys who are mismatched, who are at bad jobs. These are the good guys. These are maybe the accountants, the doctors. Um, uh, so basically people that create um, inflation while being currently at very good jobs. And finally, that's also something that Fabien uh, showed in his last figure, that contractional monetary policy actually increases misallocation of the employed. We might know this in standard models, that this changes uh, the amount of employment in the economy. But here we have an effect on the employed people. And that therefore changes uh, quite significantly, I think, how we think about inflationary responses. So now I think these, these new insights or these new perspectives also create new questions. For instance, we might want to ask how do labor market characteristics uh, affect inflation dynamics and this is an exercise that I haven't seen done in the literature uh, um, it's it's a complication but let's make this thought experiment let's suppose that workers have a bargaining power and this bargaining power basically means that if I have high bargaining power I get a high share of the firm surplus this also means that basically I can actually not renegotiate so much that means that if workers have a high bargaining power, there is not much of this inflationary response happening. So now this would mean that if workers have a high bargaining power, maybe this is a, is a stopping power to these inflationary forces. And I think that is some, a completely new perspective, I think, that would be worth to consider both empirically as well as theoretically. Um, we might also want to dive into more the uh, heterogene heterogeneity of these effects. And I'm thinking here of Fabien's other work on firms and firm sizes, and how does firm quality maybe correlate with inflationary pressures, given that we know that better matches are actually those who create a little bit more inflationary responses because on average they have better workers. And how does this new perspective actually change the welfare evaluation of monetary policy and its distributional effects? Because we know that uh, different types of people are differently uh, um, um, creating these inflationary pressures. So let me now uh, um, finish um, with a more applied perspective. And here I, have, um, I would like to speak a little bit about the new measure of slack that is proposed in this paper. And this is a very um, big contribution, I, I think, because uh, a measure of slack, I think this is something that um, is often used in policy uh, making circles. It's an important way of communicating research and actually uh, getting um, predictions out of it. Um, classically, we know uh, the output gap, the labor share, the unemployment rate. Uh, here, the authors suggest this acceptance ratio, and it is novel because it allows us to capture the quality instead of only the quantity of employment. It speaks about misallocation, just only allocation. And it's about the flow of workers instead of the stock of unemployed. And why is this important? Why is this different? It's different because it allows us to have a situation of slag um, or uh, we might have actually um, a high slack if there is a low unemployment rate. And how can this uh, work out? It's actually relatively simple to explain, and let me, let's not look at these equations. Um, suppose that we have all just been laid off and we were hired by a random firm. And let's say uh, randomly we were not searching very well, we were all at really bad firms. That means even now we are all employed that we are still at these really bad firms. And that means on average, if we get a new job offer, we're very willing to move. That means that even though if the unemployment rate can be actually low, there is a potential for having very high slack because we are all willing to move and that means there is no inflationary pressure. So this therefore sets this paper apart by saying there can be a low unemployment rate and a high willingness to move. Um, now, how realistic is this? Is there anything why we might worry that the AC rate is actually not a good proxy for slag. We, know, we need basically two things uh, for, for this to, um, to be a good proxy. Um, it's a good proxy for worker mobility if worker move to higher productive or better jobs. Let me qualify this here so it's not uh, productive only. And if there is wage setting through sequential bargaining um, in, uh, actually occurring. 
And we might uh, worry whether these points are uh, satisfied in first because we might think there is mobility um, that we know creates actually wage decreases. For instance, we know that on average the research has found that roughly 30% of all E2E mobility is associated with the wage cut. Is this now reason enough to distrust the AC ratio? I would like to say no, because first of all, the mechanism that Fabian discusses here can actually lead to wage decreases. And second, I would also like to argue, let's suppose it's not because of the sequential bargaining. Let's suppose there is maybe amenities that drive all this. We know from the literature that actually there is a high correlation between um, productivity and um, amenities in the data. Therefore, I do not think that this is a really big uh, point against this AC measure. Uh, another thing that we might be worried about, how many firms are in fact wage posting and how many firms are in fact wage bargaining? And here I can cite from my own work um, with uh, Jean-Marc Robin, where we're currently estimating the share of bargaining firms and wage posting firms, and we find that roughly 44% of the Austrian firms are, in fact, uh, bargaining firms. So even though not all firms might be doing it, there is still a considerable share of the economy that are actually involved in this mechanism. And therefore, I think that the AC ratio is a very valuable tool. And let me say the obvious. It's a very easy measure to calculate. This is a complicated mechanism where basically workers have heterogeneous outside options. And still, the AC ratio is something that's really easy to compute only with uh, either recall data or labor force surveys. So that's something that is actually readily available. So overall, let me just um, sum up and say that this is a highly influential paper on shop propagation. And I'm looking forward to your next paper with uh, Giuseppe. Thank you very much, Kerstin. So uh, I would like to give you a few minutes to respond. Uh, well, the, yeah, uh, there's, there's not much to respond to. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with, you know, uh, thank you very much for, for all the, the very kind comments. Uh, uh, you know, there were a, a few uh, criticisms in your, in, your, in your discussion, but you, you've addressed them yourself. So I, I, I'm not sure what, I, what else, what there is for me to say here. Uh, I'll just say, so a, a couple of things. So uh, it's clearly we, we, we do need to think more about heterogeneity. I mean, it's minimal in this, in this, uh, in this particular rendition of the, the model where we, we've really sort of, uh, you know, sacrificed, uh, uh, you know, uh, realism for tractability in, 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 in that particular, uh, particular dimension. Uh, uh, Okay, so in, in terms of, okay, it's uh, one thing that I want to highlight, well, you did a much better job than I did of sort of summarizing the, the paper, and one thing that I want to highlight and what you said, which is I think is, is quite important, is that uh, monetary policy, the, in this framework, I mean, it shows that monetary policy does affect mismatch, and I think that's something that was kind of, is, was, was not a sort of commonly sort of, uh, you know, uh, shared idea in, in the literature before. Uh, another thing you said is that, and it's true that sequential auctions, the way that, that, we, um, that, that we model it here, sort of maximizes the scope for renegotiation. And if you had, obviously, if workers were to capture the entire surplus up front, then you wouldn't have any inflationary pressure. Of course, that's not a realistic kind of um, situation, but this is something that quantitatively we have to think much better about. Uh, in terms of what you said about, you know, the acceptance rate and, and you know, situations in which it might be a, a worse proxy for, uh, for misallocation. Uh, one thing you said is amenities, uh, and, then, and, and then you gave the answer that I was going to give, which is that, uh, 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 I mean, it's true that if, if workers move for amenities, then, then the acceptance rate is not going to be directly related to inflationary pressure. However, you know, this is to the extent that there are compensating differentials, yeah. and the evidence for compensating differentials is not, is not always, you know, as you said, I mean, there's, there's usually uh, positive correlations between, between amenities and, and, and the quality of jobs. In terms of wage posting versus wage bargaining, I mean, even in the wage, I mean, the wage posting model would be more difficult to, to embed in, into a, a new Keynesian framework, but um, at least in the steady state version of it, uh, you know, wages are still, you know, positively actually, they're a, they're a one to one increasing function of productivity in, in, in the wage posting model. So, so even in that case, you know, if workers just go for higher wages, I think, I think the AC rate would still, at least in principle, be a, be a measure for, for mismatch. Uh, 
And that's, that's all I, I have to say. I'm, I'm be very keen to read your, your paper with Jean-Marc on, on, on Austrian data. So thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Very good, thank you. So let me open the floor for questions. Um, please, if you have questions, raise your hand and um, we have volunteers with microphones. If you could come here, please. So Laura Gatti, ECB. So um, the Fed cut interest rates yesterday, and so I'm wondering what your take on that is based on the AC rate and that measure of slack. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that is a difficult question. I'm, I'm going to, to, to dodge that question by saying that, uh, uh, actually adding to uh, or expanding on one of Kirsten's sort of points in, in the discussion is that, uh, um, you know, uh, I argued and, and Kirsten argued as well that the AC rate was a very, very easy measure to, to actually construct from, from the data. Well, uh, it's true up to the, <laughs> up, to the, up to the point that, up to the fact that uh, uh, data on job-to-job -job mobility are usually not as promptly available as, as data on, on unemployment to employment uh, uh, mobility. And so that's my way of dodging your question, which I haven't really looked at um, at, uh, at at the, uh, the you know the evolutions of the AC rate recently in, in the U.S. It always comes with a bit of a lag. Um, so uh, you know, rather than just making up an answer, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to sort of uh, punt. Yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. One further question here, and then there. Hi, uh, Clémence Berson, ECB. Uh, I was wondering a bit if you can use your model um, with more heterogeneity for workers, because this job ladder is most useful for high-skilled workers and maybe less effective for uh, low-skilled workers. And so I was wondering if you can make it, use it in your model or, or not. Thank you. Y yes, so, okay, so I'll, I'll say two things about that. So. Uh, one is, of course, so, you know, so here we have a, a model of the macro economy where workers are ex ante homogeneous. And, and you know, obviously, if we wanted to make the model sort of quantitatively more serious, we would need to look into, into those questions. And we could have segmented markets. And, and you know, to the extent that the, the data allows, we could, have, we, we, could, we could look at you know, separate categories of workers along more of the permanent characteristics like skill levels and, um, uh, and, and uh, things like that. Uh, and I'm blanking on the second thing that I was going to say. Um, oh yes, which was uh, uh, you, you, so you're saying that the job ladder ma matters more for uh, for uh, skilled workers than unskilled workers. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, certainly the the wage setting mechanisms uh, are probably are probably quite different between low skilled workers and, and high skilled workers, and that high skilled workers. You know, one would think of those as typically having more bargaining power, more more kind of ability to bargain, and the low skill labor markets as being more of the wage posting type, where firms just make, hope you know, sort of uh, equal treatment type uh, take it or leave it offers. But even in that, as we were discussing before, even in that context, I you know I I, I at least if if I take the steady state model as as a benchmark, you know the the same the same uh, principle would apply. So so wages would be uh, a reflection of how productive jobs are. Hmm. We had a further question here from the first floor. Yannick, how do you PF Barcelona? Um, Kirsten mentioned in passing the endogeneity of search uh, intensity. Could you comment on it? Because it's changing over the cycle, yeah. and it's different from the employed versus the unemployed. Yes. And so do you have an idea how it could affect the outcome? One of the things that you might worry about is, is amplification, because it's, there's also possibility for you know, uh, multiple equilibrium, because if everyone searches, you want to search. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, so two things about that. So uh, there have been follow-up. There has been follow-up work from, from, from our paper where which have looked at uh, variations over the cycle in uh, relative search intensity or relative search effort of employed versus unemployed. Um, uh, and typically, of, so, and, and those variations have been treated as exogenous as far as I know, at least in the papers that I know of. Uh, and, but, uh, and, and it's been sort of highlighted by those authors that uh, uh, um, 
uh, you know, Facini and Malosi, for example, or uh, uh, Sardar, Berenci, and, and co-authors that uh, shocks to, to relative search intensity are, are important in explaining uh, sort of inflation dynamics. So that's certainly something that we want to, to, uh, to explore. In terms of endogenizing search effort, I mean, in principle, it's not hard to do. I mean, we know how to do it. It's just a matter of saying, okay, there's a cost function, and you equate the marginal cost of search to the marginal returns. And the marginal returns to search are going to be, if you're employed, higher when you're mismatched. And so when there's a lot of mismatch, uh, workers are going to search harder. And you know, if you remember the first couple of slides that I, that I you know, I when I presented this decomposition of the AC rate, I had this ratio of search efforts. And you know, that's b based on this intuitive re reasoning, I sort of argued that uh, uh, you know, this ratio of search efforts was going to go actually in, in, our, in our direction. Uh, assuming that unemployed search effort is not going to, 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 vary, to vary as much as, 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 as that of, 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 of the employed, simply because unemployed workers, at least in the simple job ladder model, is, are thought of as the most mismatched people in, in, in the labor market. They're at the bottom rung of the, rung of the, of, of the job ladder. And therefore, uh, you know, their search effort is only going to respond to aggregate shocks, like shocks to or you know, variations in, in labor market tightness. Now that's all me talking about sort of intuition, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, putting this into 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 practice in a model is going to be to be to be, and, and the multiple equilibria, as I'm aware of, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, well, okay, I, uh, this is something that we'll definitely uh, you know, have to think about as well. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much, Fabian and Kerstin. With that, we'll move to the second paper. Uh, our presenter is Jane Ringert, who's assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame, and who will present her paper entitled The Search Cost of Inflation. And the discussion is Jordi Gali, who doesn't need introduction here, but let me still say professor at Pompeo Fabra and affiliated with CRI. Thanks for being with us. And Jane, the floor is with you. Let me see for you. Thanks very much uh, to the organizers for including us on the program. Um, and thank you for the encouragement to uh, present a relatively young paper. Um, so this is joint work with Laura Pelsoff at Duke and Jesse Badur, who is a graduate student at Duke. Um, so what we're kind of thinking about is what are the costs of inflation, right? You know, if we think about um, expected inflation or, you know, trend inflation. We think about this as affecting welfare like primarily through uh, price dispersion, right? Um, if we think about unexpected temporary inflation, uh, this has the potential to kind of redistribute welfare from one person to another, so there's not really a net cost here. Um, and kind of one of the things that is motivating us to think uh, about our model in this framework is that, you know, if you look at some of the literature, like looking for empirical evidence on uh, price dispersion story, you know, they actually refer to this as kind of elusive, right? We can't totally find this. It's hard to find um, price dispersion related to inflation in the data, okay? So we're gonna think about the cost of inflation um, in the labor market specifically in this paper. Um, so we're, motivating from prior work from other people and then work that we, we have done. Um, so there's this literature that shows that workers perceive inflation uh, as a negative shock to their buying power, right? Their real wages decline when inflation goes up. Um, and in another paper, Laura and I show that uh, workers um, intensify their search effort uh, on the job uh, when their inflation expectations go up. Okay, so uh, our theory here is that they're intensifying their search effort in order to adjust their wage either by moving to a new job with a higher wage or renegotiate their wage at some point uh, with, their, with their current firm. Okay, so search is not free. The search requires an effort of the, of the worker. Um, and we're gonna develop a model that thinks about the costs of unexpected inflation or an inflationary shock uh, in the labor market. So much of the welfare loss that the workers are gonna face um, is gonna be a real wage loss. So when the inflation shock hits, their real wage goes down, um, but this is redistributive to the firm. Um, 
the worker intensifies their uh, search effort, um, their search effort decision is going to be endogenous to their real wage. Um, and this is going to lead to a net loss of welfare in the, in the economy. Uh, this is somewhat ameliorated because when the worker searches, uh, uh, workers make more frequent contacts and they're more likely to reallocate up the job ladder, increasing kind of the productivity of their matches. Okay. So what does this look like? Um, we're going to have some exogenous aggregate productivity, uh, Z, which is going to grow deterministically at rate G. Um, and then we have a price level that is also growing deterministically um, in a balanced growth path. Um, we're going to have an, a unit mass of exogenous vacancies. Um, and these are going to be type Y, uh, where some firms will be more productive than other firms. Um, and when a firm makes a match, the production from that match uh, will be a function of aggregate productivity and the firm's productivity. So it's actually just going to be uh, z times little y. Um, we're going to have some workers that are employed and unemployed. Um, and they're going to make search effort decisions, which determine their contact rate uh, with openings. Uh, so there's going to be some real cost of search uh, that the worker has to pay. Um, we're going to have exogenous separations at rate delta. And actually, one of the things that we will incorporate later is that we're going to make um, separations less likely at more productive firms. Um, we're going to have the real value of unemployment be uh, fixed, or just depend on the level of aggregate productivity, but not the price level. We're mostly interested, uh, building off our prior work, on the search behavior of the currently employed. Okay. So the way that contracts are set up is that firms are going to get initial offer workers uh, a nominal wage W. And there's going to be a kind of determined growth path for that wage, which depends on the growth of productivity and the growth of the price level. Uh, so the wage that you're offered is going to depend on your employment status and on the wage that you're making at your current firm. Um, if we didn't have any growth, this would be very similar to just bargaining over the real wage um, and having a real wage that's fixed over the match. So a way to think about this is this is kind of like a cost of living adjustment, where your wage is guaranteed to grow at the same rate as productivity, um, your real wage, that is. Um, so this is renegotiated only by mutual consent or only if there's a credible, a credible outside offer. So when uh, workers match with outside offers, uh, Firms are able to make counteroffers, and Bertrand competition ensues. Um, so we're going to have like values of unemployment, uh, employment, and then the firm value. I'm really only going to talk about the value um, to the employed today. Uh, we're going to assume that firms are making take it or leave it offers to the unemployed. Um, more productive firms will be able to offer uh, employed workers um, lower real wages. Uh, so the firm needs to make the unemployed worker an offer that will kind of make them indifferent between staying unemployed and becoming employed. And the more productive firm has some option value to the worker, because as you match with other firms, that more productive firm has more capability to match outside offers. Okay, So this is where most of our action on the search cost is coming from. If we think about a worker who is currently at firm one, uh, so that firm has productivity Y1, uh, and that worker is getting paid, paid a nominal wage W. Um, this firm makes a contact, or this worker makes a contact with firm two, whose productivity is W2. Okay, so in the first case, um, nothing happens. Okay, this is a non-credible threat for the firm. Um, and what happens here is if you know the firm, the that W prime, which is the wage that has been projected forward at the rate of growth of productivity and the rate of growth of the price level, um, if that wage is greater than uh, the new firm, basically just promising all of the output that would come from the match uh, to to the worker. So if the best that the other firm can do is offer the, the entire productivity and your current wage is higher than that, nothing, nothing happens. Your wage does not get renegotiated. Um, the firm could also, the 
firm two could also poach the worker. Um, so if, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing that. Um, if uh, Y1 is less than Y2, um, our new wage is gonna satisfy uh, this condition where the new firm basically gives you everything that you would have produced with your old firm. Um, and then the last case um, is where you stay with your current firm, but uh, your wage gets renegotiated. Um, so in this case, uh, the productivity of the new firm is high enough that your old firm uh, delivers you everything that you would have produced with that firm, uh, and your wage goes up. Um, so we're gonna think uh, particularly about that first firm that triggers a contract renegotiation as being kind of important for um, understanding the worker's incentive um, and how this goes. Okay, so this first firm um, is gonna be the one where uh, your current firm can actually match, uh, match their wage offer and your wage will go up. Okay, so if inflation is having a downward effect on your current real wage, right, or if you anticipate um, that your future wage is not gonna keep up um, on the path that you agreed on with, with the firm, um, there is a wider set of firms that meet this criteria. Okay, so if we look at it visually, right, we have kind of three regions, right? We have the region where nothing happens to your wage, uh, and we have the region where your wage is renegotiated, but you stay with your current firm. Um, what a fall in, the real wage, in your real wage is going to do is going to move that Q down. Um, so it's going to expand the range of uh, firms that you can match to that trigger renegotiation. Uh, the range of firms that you can match to that would trigger um, a job-to-job -job transition is going to stay the same. Okay, what's going to happen is that our workers are going to internalize this change in the range of firms that could trigger renegotiation um, as a you know, benefit of search. So this is going to drive them to search more, and as a result, they will match more to firms that trigger renegotiation and more to firms that trigger a job-to-job -job transition. Okay, so just looking at this here in the value um, of employment, uh, this firm is getting, uh, this worker is getting a kind of real wage. Um, they're paying some cost, um, and then the, some cost of search. Okay, and then there's a few cases up here, but the kind of important ones are the ones where nothing happens. That's this bottom term where your wage just continues on the path that it was going to with your old firm. Um, and then the middle one where, you know, this match with the new firm uh, triggers some sort of renegotiation of your wage. Okay. Um, so what this is going to give us are some, what these are are search policy and job-to-job uh, -job transition uh, policies uh, for workers at different firm types and different real wages. Okay, so in the red, we have our most productive firm. Okay, so search uh, is higher, search effort is higher uh, at more productive firms uh, because those firms have a greater ability to match outside offers. Okay, the range of real wages here is different across these three firms uh, because different firms, like based on their productivity, are able to support different levels of real wages. More productive firms can pay more they can also make lower offers out of unemployment um, and have them accepted because they offer the option value to the worker of being able to renegotiate their wage later. Okay, so what you see for all three of these firms, though, is that our search effort is declining in the real wage. Okay, um, and this logic behind that, I think, is pretty, pretty simple. As your real wage is higher, there are fewer firms that can trigger a renegotiation uh, or a move. Okay, um, but the renegotiation is the only thing that's uh, moving with, with the real wage. Okay. Um, sorry, so the, um, the next figure shows you 
the implied job-to-job -job likelihood. Um, so the job-to-job -job, like transition likelihood is lowest for the people at the highest firm, at the highest productivity firm. Uh, this is because these people are very unlikely to match to a firm that's better because their firm is so good already. Okay, you see here that the likelihood that I move is actually declining in my real wage, um, partially because I search less if I have a high real wage. Okay, um, so thinking about the cost of inflation in this context, one thing that results from, we make this balanced growth um, assumption, balanced growth path assumption to solve the model. Um, and what this is gonna mean is that an economy with growth rate, a growth rate of price level one and a growth rate of price level two, like 2% 2 and 4% trend inflation, uh, they're gonna be the same, okay, as long as those wages are indexed the way that we've described. Um, so we're gonna consider repeated unan unanticipated shocks to the rate of inflation. Um, so the way this is gonna work is that at some date, uh, the price level unexpectedly grows more than, uh, more than we thought it was going to. Um, so since your nominal wages were contracted to grow at one rate, uh, they're now gonna go, grow at a rate that is lower than that, okay? Um, and the way that we implement this, we're gonna start out in the balanced growth path um, at dates tau to tau plus t. Um, we're going to implement the shock repeatedly, uh, and then we're gonna shut the shock off um, at tau plus t plus one. Okay, and we could look at a bunch of different outcomes. We could look at real wages for existing and new matches. We could look at search effort among the employed. Um, what I'm gonna show you today um, is the kind of worker uh, welfare relative to, worker and firm welfare relative to the baseline. Okay, so this is our shock. Um, this is admittedly a very large shock. We're not trying to do a quantitative exercise just yet. We're kind of just fixing ideas for how this is gonna work. Um, but what happens is the inflation rate jumps up for about two years, okay? And then it comes back down to where it was. Okay, and we calculate the flow value for each worker uh, in the case of a shock and in the case without a shock. Um, so that flow value for the worker is their real wage uh, minus the cost um, if they're employed, and then it's the unemployment benefit if they're unemployed. Um, so we're gonna measure the average flow value loss uh, in each period. Um, so we have this kind of shock uh, minus no shock o over the case of the shock. So this will be kind of a percentage of the welfare they would have had in the case of no shock, okay? So when we implement this shock, we get this really big flow value loss, um, something like negative 15% of the value at the peak of the shock is lost here. Um, but when we separate out the parts of this, okay, we have some that's coming from the wage and that, in our model, is gonna go back to the firm, okay? Um, the blue portion, though, is the search cost, okay? So this is kind of what's left that the entire economy is losing, okay? Uh, we have this kind of very simple model right now that I think we, we do want to extend where all of that wage is just going straight to the firm, um, but there is this blue part that I think we're, we're very interested in, okay? So if you look at just the blue part, this is about negative uh, 1.2% of that value at, at peak. Um, and there's a couple of parts of that that are canceling out as well, okay? So we have these kind of blue search costs, but we have some other costs as well. Um, in the purple, we have lost unemployment benefits. So how this is working is that as these firms are, or as these workers are reallocating up the job ladder, uh, because separation uh, is less likely at more productive firms, we actually have people who are less likely to fall into unemployment. Um, we also have some additional match output, that's the pink that's actually a positive, 
uh, because we're matching people to better jobs, and in these better jobs, they produce more. Okay. Um, so just to conclude, uh, we developed this model in which search is endogenous to the real wage, um, and real wages are allowed to erode with inflation. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to mean that a larger set of outside firms can prompt renegotiation. Uh, this is going to incentivize workers to search. Um, and we're going to see here that the search is the net cost of inflation. But because these workers are searching, um, they are more likely to uh, make contacts with firms uh, all across the productivity distribution. So we're going to see uh, more workers for um, matching to more, more productive offers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you much. So then we move to the discussion. Okay, well, first let me thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to to discuss this paper. I think this is a very welcome line of research because uh, our, you know, in the standard, uh, standard models that we use for monetary poli policy analysis, the cost of inflation boil down to relative price dispersion and the distortions that this uh, generates in the allocation of resources. And I think there's a large disconnect between this uh, in feature or this property of, of the standard models and what uh, policymakers and the public uh, have in mind when, in terms of a, you know, what, what they perceive as, as cost of inflation. So any effort you know, to, to try to uncover a possible uh, you know, additional uh, costs of inflation that uh, are well microfounded and so on uh, is, is, is very welcome and, and this paper is you know is an effort in a very good effort in that direction so let me very briefly because um, Jane did a very good job at this summarizing the paper let me just remind you what the the paper does so the authors uh, develop a model that has uh, you know, many ingredients at first heterogeneous firms with different productivities, nominal wage rigidities, uh, surge and matching in the labor market, including on the job uh, surge, or exogenous separations, and there is endogenous uh, surge effort, and that's the key, I guess, the key and novel element of the paper, the, this um, surge, endogeneity of surge effort. Um, then <clears throat> the starting point of this economy is a balanced growth path in which inflation is constant and, and productivity growth is constant, and wages, the nominal wage is indexed to those two variables. So, um, okay, so that's the starting point. And then what the authors do is to, is to you know, shock this economy with a, a, a sequence of unanticipated inflationary shocks, um, and, and then they examine the, the implications for, you know, for aggregate variables and uh, focusing on welfare. Okay. Now, so the, the main trade-off here is, is, is clear. So uh, when inflation goes up, um, real, wages of, uh, real wages go down, real wage, wages of in, incumbent workers, because the nominal wage is um, in principle fixed. And that induces a more intensive uh, job search on their part which leads to, um, in many occasions, to a, uh, uh, matching with a firm that um, by, you know, by construction will have a higher productivity. Um, and hence, you know, this is, well, from, there's an increase in, in aggregate efficiency, so to speak, no? Because there's a reallocation of workers from low productivity firms to higher productivity firms induced by this, by, by this inflationary shock. Um, but of course, on, there's more on the job search, and that's costly too, okay? It's a, it's a dead weight uh, uh, loss. 
so the, the, they engage in a quantitative exercise, um, and then so they examine, you know, what are the consequences for of an inflationary episode, um, a large inflationary episode, uh, and, and they show that uh, this is costly for workers on average, clearly because real wages uh, go down, but also for society, because the um, higher the productivity gains resulting from this re reallocation of workers to higher productivity firms are more than uh, offset by, by the surge uh, deadweight losses, okay? So inflation is overall costly for society. So I think this is a novel, um, it's a, it, so the contribution of the paper is, um, is manifold. No, first, uh, they, the, they point to a, an inflation channel that, uh, sorry, a, 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 a cost of inflation channel that is novel, as far as I understand. Uh, this is the endogenous surge effort. There's this famous paper from, I think, from the late 70s uh, by uh, Fisher and Modigliani, where they have this long list of uh, reasons why inflation is uh, costly. I think there are like 25 or so. And it's, this one is not there. So uh, it's, it was actually hard to come up with a, with a, 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 um, you know, a, a source of inflation costs that it was not on that list. Um, so the initial misallocation um, can be improved through positive inflation. That's an interesting in, insight by encouraging the search uh, for jobs in more productive firms. Okay, so the inflation in that sense acts as a grease uh, in the wheels. No, it makes you know it wakes uh, workers up and makes them look for for better uh, um, matches. But uh, search is costly, and that's uh, that's the trade-off. Um, so search here is a. It can be viewed as a cost of catching up with inflation. If you want to catch up with inflation, given that your nominal wage um, is um, fixed, or it's just indexed to, to trend inflation, okay, um, you need to make this, this effort. Okay? So this, the, I, I view this as being akin to, to a menu cost. No? You, you, you want to reset your wage, you have to pay uh, some menu cost. So I think the, I think the authors should, um, there is a very recent paper, so the authors may not have seen it, so and, um, by Guerrero and Hazel, Leanne and Patterson, that, uh, that model is very similar in spirit to, to this paper. And they, 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 they essentially have a, a model with menu costs of adjusting wages. They call it the conflict cost because you know, changing wages uh, generate. Uh, in order to, to, to get uh, your wage to be reset, you, you need to, you know, to engage in some conflict with your employer, and that is, is perceived as costly, and that they actually have survey evidence that that's the case. Okay, so um, I have uh, a number of, uh, th this is more like a referee report, I have to admit, than, than than a, 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 um, a, a usual discussion, but uh, hopefully it will be useful to the authors. You know, some, some suggestions and, and, and questions also and comments. So one, I think one weakness of the paper is that um, inflation is modeled as being exogenous here. Okay, so there's no feedback to inflation. So in contrast with the previous paper here, obviously this cannot be a, a model of inflation in itself because inflation is exogenous, okay? So, um, there are, so uh, the alternative to this would be to have a model um, in which in inflation is endogenous and is driven by some aggregate shocks, no? exogenous monetary expansion, uh, a negative productivity shock or whatsoever, that will do, those shocks will do something more than just changing inflation because they will al also change some other variables in, 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 in the model. And obviously the advantage of that model is that there will be also a feedback from wages to prices and that's not, modeled in the current, in the current, in this, in the, in this paper. I think another interesting thing that the authors could do is to compare uh, aggregate outcomes and including welfare across models. Now they, they have this baseline model and they examine the properties of this baseline model. I think it would be interesting to see what, what is the role played by the different ingredients of the model. The model is a very rich model, it has many ingredients, so um, by turning off and on the, these different ingredients, including the endogeneity of on the job search and uh, for, um, product, heterogeneity in, in productivity and so on, we could have a, a better idea of what is the role played by each of them. Now, um, 
th they, I think they, this is an interesting um, observation, I think. There, in, in the model, uh, when inflation increases, um, it is optimal from an individual point of view to, to, in, to, to in, uh, search more intensively. Now, in the aggregate, uh, the cost, this search cost outweighs the output gains, okay? So it's, it seems that the, the search response is inefficient for the economy as a whole, okay? So one question is, well, would society be better off if we were to ban uh, or tax at least uh, this uh, on-the-job search, okay? And in any case, I think it provides a case for, for indexation you know, to actual inflation, not only to trend inflation. Um, also, a question, uh, the model, as far as I can tell, it is symmetric, and so uh, does deflation increase welfare? I would say so, that def deflation would, would in, in increase we welfare. So this is an interesting difference with the standard New Keynesian model in which um, welfare losses come from deviations from price stability on either side, okay? So I think this, the, the author should, should uh, discuss this. Um, um, in the paper they, they don't it currently. Now, in, in their quantitative analysis focuses, looks at a specific inflationary episode. Uh, you know, part, it's one exercise, so to speak, okay, with a particular size of the shock, a particular length, and so on. So we, uh, no, uh, the readers of the paper, you know, uh, don't know whether the, this conclusion that they reach is, is a robust conclusion. I mean, would this result that uh, a positive inflation shock reduces welfare? Uh, how general it, it is, okay? Because there may be nonlinearities that may, may uh, you know, may uh, lead to different answers depending on, on the size and length of the shock. Now, the, the calibration of the shock, well, as Jane said, but they, are, they were not trying to do something particularly realistic. I think it's very large. You know, there's an, an expected inflation of 11% above trend per year for three years. I mean, this is something that we haven't seen in, in advanced economies. I don't know, maybe we've never seen it. Uh, so that, of course, obviously implies huge real wage declines if there is no adjustment of the wage and, and you know, workers really have to to, um, to, um, um, to respond to that by, by search, searching very intensely. Now, a trend inflation in the model is neutral because of this assumed indexation you know, to, to trend inflation and to trend productivity. But this is counterfactual. No, wage, nominal wages are not indexed to productivity or inflation. Uh, instead, they remain unchanged for a long time. Okay? So I think it and maybe as in a separate paper, I think the authors, uh, I think it would be very interesting to have an analysis of optimal trend inflation in the context of this model. What is the optimal um, um, steady state rate of, uh, of inflation? Now we know in the, new, in the New Keynesian model, in the absence of uh, zero lower bound, but with sticky wages, the, it's, it's, very, it's close to zero, but maybe it's different here. You know, and you, the, pa the paper may provide a rationale for maybe positive um, inflation targets even in the absence of the zero lower bound, obviously. One thing that I, I think, you know, it's, a, uh, um, it's um, something that I quite don't quite understand, but it may be a weakness of, of the framework, is that this distribution of vacancies, f of y, that an individual faces when searching for a job, this seems to be constant. Uh, you know, you always have the same opportunity, so to speak, okay? independently of the, 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 um, the intensity of the reallocation process that is going on. No one would think that if there are more workers that are you know, matching with better firms, then uh, the opportunities that are left for me are, are reduced. But here, somehow, this, this distribution remains, remains um, unchanged. Okay? Now, I think that um, the, the wage setting mechanism, and this is something that the authors may not stress enough, in my opinion, um, it's, it's an example of a state-dependent wage setting, which obviously is more realistic than you know, Calvo or um, other uh, uh, time-dependent uh, models. And it's different from, so it, it, it's, it's something that it's, I think it's worth, it, it's worth em emphasizing as an alternative to menu costs or Calvo. No? So I, I think the, the author should uh, discuss and you know, maybe provide some evidence for, for this. 
And also, um, the wage is assumed uh, to be fully flexible for new hires. When, when there is a new match, the, you know, the firm can set the offer whatever wage it wants. No? Um, this may not be realistic because, you know, um, in, 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 in the real world, firms have many uh, employees, not just one employee. And there may, there, you know, may they, there may be a case for not deviating too much from the wage of, of, of their other employees. You know? Okay, now the, 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 the paper doesn't have any empirical evidence. Uh, but uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at some of the predictions. So um, in, the, in the model, uh, in, uh, higher price inflation leads to more external offers. Now, some are matched, that are, um, uh, leads to higher wages and, and, and hence higher price inflation because the costs increase for the firms. And some are not matched by the current firm. And this leads to higher uh, employ employment to employment transitions and, and also higher wages. So first, a, a, clear, a clear implication is that you know, high inflation leads to higher uh, wage, in higher inflation leads to higher wage inflation. So there's a kind of wage price spiral that we find in the evidence. But again, this is not really a, 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 uh, something that is specific to this model. This would be very, this happened, the, the, you, you get this in the standard, in the standard uh, New Keynesian model, for instance. But I think the, the second prediction is more interesting. So um, uh, higher inflation should lead to higher um, employment to employment transitions. And, you know, I had no clue whether this was the case or not. So I, I looked, I, I, you know, I um, dig uh, up some, some data. So here you have um, so a core PC inflation in red and the employment, employment transition rate from the, this, this paper by Fabian and, and co-authors. Um, and you see until, you know, starting in around 2002, and obviously I have no clue why this is the case, there seems to be a, 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 a positive correlation. You know, a significant, you know, I run a, a tested for this, it's, it's highly significant. There's a positive correlation. Um, in particular, in the recent episode, we see that the, the, the transition rates, the employment to employment transition rates have increased a lot. Actually, there, there seems to be also a nonlinear response. Uh, um, so, um, uh, so that seems to be there, okay? So it's a prediction of the, of the paper and uh, uh, now, after the previous paper, now this gets me a bit confused because you, obviously you're not, you are not looking at this specific relationship. Your causality worked in the opposite direction and you were looking at that ratio, but the, the relationship seems to be, to, to be the opposite from the one in the, in the previous paper. So just to, just to I'm gonna end up, end here. This, I think there's a, an in, a valuable contribution to two liter, literatures, one on the cost of inflation, also in the role of labor market search in, in monetary models. But I think in order to, to be, to, to be a, an even more significant contribution, I think the, the author should endogenize inflation. The main novel element is the endogeneity of search effort. I think the paper has a lot of potential, but still some work to be done. And the question that remains, and I think is important that the author should address at some point, is what are the lessons for monetary policy of, uh, of, of a world in which you know, there's in, this endogeneity of search effort. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane, if you want to take a few minutes more, I mean, you didn't use up your time yeah. when you presented, so if now you want to take a few more minutes to resp uh, reply, please. Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, that was uh, extre extremely thorough and, uh, you know, lots and lots of good points. I think um, your point about symmetry is correct, um, which, you know, is a little bit unusual. I think, you know, some of this is we have linear utility. Um, I think if you relax this, this would make that less extreme. Um, but I also think that a lot of your comments are going to be, like my intuition is that making inflation endogenous will address a lot of these things, right? If inflation is affecting other variables as well, um, deflation is coming from somewhere, so we won't necessarily just see a big increase in welfare. Um, uh, so in you know the the version that we sent you and the version that we pre presented, um, you know you're right. We don't have any kind of like 
real wage adjustment, um, so incumbent workers are just kind of allowed to fall and fall and fall. Um, we're adjusting in such a way that if your real, real wage falls enough, your firm will have to adjust it. Um, this will kind of keep the gaps between incumbent workers and new matches more reasonable. Um, uh, so yes, in, the other thing is, in this case, trend inflation is neutral um, because of the indexing. Um, we are kind of trying to work on a version of the model where you have um, like cyclical shocks to trend inflation um, and thinking about monetary policy as potentially minimizing the variance of those shocks, um, which could be more of a takeaway for monetary policy. I think what our thinking is, and I think this is where it would actually be very important to generate some actual feedback of the wage into inflation, is that if we have people responding to inflation in this way, um, and it's generating potential upward pressure um, on the wage, um, that this could potentially uh, be a way in which people's behavior is leading to um, upward pressure on wages and potentially upward pressure on prices. So to do that, we really do need to uh, get the wage feeding back into the price itself. Um, so I think, you know, we have a lot to do. Um, we do have, you know, some empirical evidence in, in our other paper, which is kind of what, what led us to this. Um, that paper is uh, mostly about inflation expectations, um, but what we, um, show in that paper is, you know, we have some survey evidence uh, where we gave people hypothetical levels of inflation and we said, you know, would you search for a new job if inflation was 2% uh, or 10% um, and we found that uh, a much larger share responded that they would search for a new job under 10% inflation than under 2% inflation. Uh, we also have some cross-sectional uh, evidence using the New York Fed's con survey of consumer expectations uh, where we show that workers with higher inflation expectations are uh, more likely to search on the job, more likely to make a job-to-job -job transition, uh, they have lower reservation wages, um, and uh, so because of the kind of joint effect of more, being more likely to search on the job and uh, having lower reservation wages, they're also more likely to uh, transition jobs in, in, a, in a small model there. Um, so kind of that paper led us into this paper thinking about kind of what is, what is the effect of realized inflation. Um, and uh, in that paper, we had a very small, um, or a model where all of the movement uh, in the labor market was happening through job to job transitions. So we were actually kind of trying to think about wage changes for job stayers. Um, so I think we need to continue to work on uh, exactly your point that the, the gaps for the, the new hires and the incumbents get really bigger because that was kind of the point of moving to this model was we wanted uh, people to be able to search in response to inflation and raise their wage um, both by changing jobs and by uh, renegotiating their wage. Okay, thank you very much. So let me open the floor for questions from the audience or from the panelists also, if Fabien or Kerstin want to raise anything. Well, maybe I, uh, Please. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a, something that puzzles me a little bit, it, uh, which is, so, uh, so th this particular wage setting rule that you have, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, th to think on, you know, in, in, in what circumstances firms who would have a choice of, you know, how to set wages would, mm -hmm. would, a, would actually go about doing that. So they, they're, they're facing this moral hazard problem, which is on the job search on the part of worker, which, workers, which is also costly for mm -hmm. them. Uh, so the first question is, why would they want to set wages in nominal terms at, at all? And if they, if they could, if they did, or if they were forced to do that, would they uh, commit to indexation like that, or uh, and how would they respond to, to inflationary shocks? I think there's a there's a framework. I mean, which I'm I'm pretty certain you you know f for that. I mean, there's work by Rasmus Lenz on on um, you know, the, these papers about hidden search. Mm -hmm. uh, 
where, uh, I mean, there's no inflation, or everything is, 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 uh, is thought of in, in, in real terms in, in those papers, but, but where the, the, you know, he solves the firm's problem in, in uh, you know, sort of exactly those terms when uh, they face a, a situation where workers can search on the job, or negotiation occurs by mutual consent, so what's the best uh, contract that can be offered to the worker in order to incentivize them not to search too hard. Yeah. Uh, I wonder whether, you know, in, in, in this context where I suppose you force these firms to set nominal wages rather than, right. than real wages, you know, how, how would they behave in that, in that environment? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's like basically are these optimal contracts? Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's a good question. Um, that's something we need to think more about. Okay, further questions? Yes, please. Hi, a clarification question. The result that uh, the um, cost of search outweighs the efficiency gains of job uh, transitions, is that a general finding or does it depend on parameters and et cetera? Um, on the calibration. It would likely depend on um, on the calibration. That's something we can test how robust it is to changing the calibration in, in different ways. Um, I think we haven't tried it in every single way, so um, we should we we should. Further questions? Yeah, follow up on that, but, but the the so what um, what is the source of the inefficient? So, as I wrote in in my discussion, no, the from the point of view of the individual worker, it's optimal to do that right. to engage in that search, no. Yeah. But it ends up being bad for society. So is it because the worker doesn't take into account the costs to, for, uh, for, to firms right. of that? Right, so it's not, the search is not bilaterally efficient. It's efficient from the perspective of the worker, but the firm isn't, yeah, but the. I see. And if, may I ask Fabian about that, the empirical evidence? Uh, how do you reconcile uh, this evidence with what you showed us uh, earlier. You mean the positive correlation, yeah. the apparent positive correlation? Uh, well, I mean, I don't think it's it's incompatible. What we we're we're uh, looking at is a is a negative. What we're I've been highlighting in, in in my talk, and we're kind of highlighting now is a negative correlation over the cycle between the ratio of the EE rate over the UE rate and inflation. That that in itself is not incompatible with. No. With, uh, with, with a positive univariate correlation between EE and, and inflation. EE is just essentially the acceptance rate multiplied by the UE rate, and so, uh, you know. But it means that variations in the denominator must yes. be dominating the. Yeah, but the point, the point is that there is, you know, independent information about inflation in that, in that um, acceptance rate, in that AC rate, conditional on the UE rate. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the point that. Okay. Are there any further questions from the floor? If not, then let me thank our four speakers. Thank you very much. This was very interesting.